Thank you, everybody, for coming to this talk. Um, we have half an hour. My name is Nicolas Bolo. I go by the, the name Nico, Director of AI Research at Unity Technologies. And uh, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, the research we are doing at Unity Labs in terms of behavioral AI. AI is a big topic. It makes lots of noise nowadays. And when thinking of applying AI to games, we can be thinking of many different things. Um, today, I'm going to focus on a particular subject, everything which concerns behavior. So how to create bluffing NPCs, realistic simulations, challenging game AIs, and um, seeing behavior as something you can think of a behavior of an NPC, behavior of a city, behavior of a game world. It actually has lots of connection with storytelling. And we actually believe that many of the technical approach to create uh, behavior for NPCs could be applied to create stories. Uh, of course, this, uh, this is a little bit arbitrary. Uh, when we speak of, I mean, animations and dialogues are some form of content. So when we are going to make a behavior, we're going to create animations, we're going to create dialogues. So this is all arbitrary. But I wanted to understand roughly what we are talking about. We are talking about animating stuff in your game so that it, it does something that makes sense to you and that makes you vibrate. Uh, who are we? We are a new team. About a year, I've been here about a year, I've been at Unity for about a year, and um, the people that contributed to this demo have been here only for a few months. We have a um, strong culture of autonomous robotics in the team, and uh, also of deep learning, so really our mission is to try to push into the video games all the amazing things which are happening in other domains, industrial domains, such as uh, autonomous robotics, and uh, step up the state of AI in virtual worlds. So today I'm going to speak mostly of the uh, inner heritage we got from autonomous robotics and what we think is important and what we could reuse in games. So basically two ideas. We retain two ideas. Pretty simple, actually. The first one is a fundamental idea of using hierarchical decision-making architectures. Break your problems. So this is the idea that you can break the problem of uh, controlling a character in many sub-problems. Uh, at different scale in time and in space. So for a video game, we could think of animation at the lowest level, and then at on top, navigation, avoiding obstacles and getting where you are. And uh, at the top level, behavior, deciding your motivations and your goal. Um, when we speak of hierarchical approach, really it's not about using for each of these modules a hierarchical planner. It's really having different modules. And the important concept is that Something that really saves robotics. Uh, we don't have to solve all these problems at 60 FPS. It's important that animations are managed at smoothly at 60 FPS. Navigation, really, is it really important to change your goal at 60 FPS? Maybe you can do that only at 10 FPS. And uh, behavior, is it really interesting to revise our behavior every 60 FPS? Most of the time, no. Uh, and this is very true in robotics. So many problems that seem actually very difficult when we think of them, solving them at 60 FPS, suddenly look easier when we realize that we have a much better budget. Because the scale at which you address the problem corresponds to the frequency at which you must make decision. If you're working at a very tiny, a very small scale, you must make decision very fast. And we're working, thinking, planning for a full day of activity well. We don't need to replan our activity of the full day every second, right? So this is fundamental. Second point, uh, which we got from robotics, is um, a change of paradigm in AI, moving from what is called reactive AI to deliberative AI. Reactive AI is what the game developer knows the most. Basically, you're going to write a system that will produce an action at each instant depending on the past outcome. And everything is basically hand-coded by the developer. When you make a behavior tree, a state machine, so this is a state machine, for instance, implementing a very classical, simple behavior in a game, wonder, chase, shoot. So we start in the green state. When our enemy is inside, we move, and we, we wander at random. When we see our enemy, we move to the blue state, and we start to chase the, the enemy. And when he gets in firing distance, we shoot him. If any of the conditions become false during the game, we go back to the previous state. So we just said to the machine exactly what to do. I could use a final state machine. I could use a behavior tree. I could rule-based system. 
I'm implementing always the behavior. They are just different language to express your behavior. Behavior trees and file state machines are nothing else than a graphical interface to hack the behavior directly. OK, this contrast, it contrasts with, strongly with deliberative AI. Deliberative AI is different. We use an explicit model of our problem. And then given the current situation, we're going to solve this, this model, get a solution which is a sequence of action. We take the first action of that sequence, and we say this is our decision. So typically, navigation, think nav mesh agent, is, is typically a deliberative approach. Given an environment, we make a model of the environment. In this case, the blue thing is my model of where I could go. And then when I want to plan, I run a shorter path in this graph, and I get my shortest path. And the first step is my decision. OK? So it concerns navigation, motion planning, and more. So a very strong principle in our team is to try to move from reactive to deliberative AI. There are many reasons for that. But in short, it's way easier for the developer. We can reuse the behavior. We can easily upgrade them. We can compose behavior, which is very hard to do with behavior trees and funny state machines. And also, we, have a, we achieve more universality. We, are, we have a behavior adapted to any situation, which is not true when you hack them directly. If, you, if your behavior tree is incomplete some places, the agent will not know what to do. In, with a planner, that will never happen. OK, so the current state of the art in gaming, taking, thinking roughly, this is an approximation, but right now, behavior is made with reactive techniques, such as behavior trees, rule-based systems, or uh, stacking them sometimes, a behavior tree on top of a rule-based system, or stuff like that. Navigation is made uh, in, in, a in a deliberative way. This is the only way. And uh, animation is still made also by hand. People will go and hack animation controllers, blend trees, basically, again, saying exactly to the machine what it should do. Our goal, our first goal in this team is to show you an architecture of these three levels where everything is deliberative. Everything is a planner. Nothing is hacked. To get there, in Unity, we have NavMesh. Good. So we need two new modules. The first module is an animation planner, which allows you to plan your animation. So given the position of a character and the desired goal state, it will plan a smooth animation that stays as close as possible from your mockup data. I will not speak of that today. We don't have time. I will be back in six months with a demo of that. Today, I'm going to speak, to, to speak about the second module that we need to achieve our goal, which is a planner to decide behavior. So basically, using a planner everywhere, people use a behavior tree or a final state machine in a game. How can we do that? So most of this talk is going to be showing you, or through an example, using this character, YOLO, how we can do that. Let's go. So here is YOLO. YOLO is workaholic. He has a problem. And he works for apples. Um, I'm, going to introduce, I'm going to introduce to YOLO different levels of rationality through my slide and explain to you on the way how I do that. So first, I'm going to we, we enable YOLO to travel into his world. As you can see, the movie is just traveling. Um, the bottom of the screen is the plan. That's what YOLO plans to do. He's going to travel from one location to the other repeatedly. Why? Because we just gave him the possibility to travel. How did we do that? Well, first, we define a type. So we have a language, and I'm going to show you how it works. First, I define a type. I say my world has locations. Once I have defined this type, I go into my game scene. I use colliders, triggers, to define locations. So I put a collider, and I slide, I, I slide the game object in a window, and it becomes a location for the planner. OK? And now I will just give, I create a predicate. So a predicate is a Boolean function of one or several variables. It can be true or false. I create a predicate which I call at, at location. It means when at desk is true, it means that Yolo is at the desk, simply. OK? And now, an important concept here is how we encode actions. We encode actions with a precondition. So the action of traveling from location 1 to location 2 can be executed if you are at location 1, right? And it has two effects. Then you are no more at location 1, and you are at location 2. Simple enough. 
right? Based on that, um, okay, how do we, so we define formally the action like this in the, in the AI, and then we hook it to the game using some kind of script which is very similar to the behavior script of the final state machines. Basically, you have on, on, start, on, on action start, on action continue, on action end. And in this case, very simple for the travel action, when the action starts, we, we will just say to our navigation controller where we want to go, and we let the navigation controller go that. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple, this script, pretty empty. Okay, we have defined a formal model of the action. We have hooked it to the world through this script. Now the AI is going to plan. How does it plan? Well, it starts from an unknown location and consider everything it could do. It's almost like a star, except we are not in a, in a state space which are physical location. We're in a state space where the state is these strange things. My, my first state is at unknown. And then I can get to four states, at bed, at desk, at apple, at bottle. We're going to expand this graph to a certain depth, and then we're going to choose the path of minimum cost. So in this model, we have made the cost of the action proportional to the distance travel, logically. So the agent is going to choose the two locations which are the closest and oscillates between them. So that's what you see on the screen. This is a result of running a search algorithm in this weird graph. And we get this is the shortest path for a certain horizon. OK? This is the cheapest path in the, in the, in the graph. And that's how we get the behavior. So that's what's for navigation. Now I'm going to increase his rationality. I'm going to give him, to make him work out, as he's supposed to be. So I'm going to add a new action, which is called work. To do that, first I create a new predicate, a predicate called workstation location. So workstation location is true. Is at this location, you have a workstation when you can work. OK? And then I can create a new action. If I am at a given location, and this location is a workstation, then I can work. Simple. And what do I do? I put a negative cost on this action, which means a reward. So I make your workaholic by telling him, oh, you really love to work. I'm using the cost to give him his preferences over the actions. And if I do that, when I'm going to plan, I'm going to expand exactly the same graph, except for all the states where I am at the desk. When I'm at the desk, I can actually fire this action. So I have an extra action in my graph, the red one. And because it has positive cost, when we solve this graph, we find this path. Travel to the desk and then work, 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 work. Simple. Shortest path. OK. How did we implement this action? Again, we have a little c -sharp script in the style of the behavior of state machine. And uh, in this case, when we start the action, we will just set a trigger in our animation controller to tell him to start working. It's not more complex than that. All right, now Yolo can travel, he can work. Let's make him eat. So I'm going to add a resource, a continuous variable. I'm going to say, oh, you have hunger. Your hunger varies from 0 to 10. If you blow, if you blow your hunger, you're going to die. But if you eat more than you can, it's not, you, your hunger is not going to go negative. So death at the top, level off at the bottom. That's how the resource behaves. Okay? If you, drink, if you sleep too much, you don't get to negative fatigue. If you eat too much, you don't get to negative hunger. You stay at zero. But if you don't sleep or don't eat, you die. OK, then I'm going to create a new predicate, food location, saying that there is a food source in this location. And a new action, if I am at this location and there is food at this location, I can eat. And it will decrement my hunger by a certain value. And then if I give that to YOLO, as you can see in the plan, now he's working. He's working until he's almost going to die of hunger. And at the last minute, he goes, eat apples, and go back to work. He's a good boy. Um, so in terms of planning, now my states are a little bit more complex. My initial state, I am at unknown. I know that the desk is a workstation. I know that the apple is a source of food. And I know that my hunger is zero. That's a big step. And I will notice that in this state, you have two things that can never be deleted. A work the desk will always be a workstation, and the apple will always be food. So I can remove it from the state description and put it in a list of constants, OK? Just to say space on my slide. And now I can expand the same time of tree. 
I see that if I work, 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 work as before, I'm going to die of hunger just by expanding the tree. First travel will cost me one of hunger. First time I work will cost me five. Second time I work will break me to 11, dead. But there are other options in this tree. So the search will eventually find another path that will make me leave the desk, go to the Apple, eat, return to the desk, and return to work. And that's what you see now on the, on the animation. Okay, so I just said to YOLO, you're hungry, if you're too hungry, you die, and you can eat at any place where there is food. That's basically what I told him. And if I did that, and this is the optimal plan. Okay, now I'm going to give you the opportunity to collect one apple. Let me introduce a new thing. I'm going to introduce a predicate of apple, which tells that Yolo has an apple in his pocket. I'm going to create a new action, collect apple. If I am at a location, there is food at this location, I can pick up an apple and put it in my pocket. Then half apple becomes true. And now if half apple is true, I can eat from my pocket, which will decrement my hunger and make half apple false. Simple enough. That's what we did. Now you can see. To save time working, YOLO, when he goes eat, he fills up his pocket with one apple so that he can later eat it at work. So you can see. Work, work, go, pick apple, eat an apple, return to work, and eat the apple from your pocket. We never told him that. He found it alone. This is rational. Okay, we can let him collect three apples by making apple a resource. So I say, now no, the apple is a resource which can go between zero and three. And every action that would break the bond is just impossible. And as you can see on the slide, now he's collecting, he's filling up his apple before returning to work. Logical, so that he can spend as much time working as possible. Okay. Now we can make it sleep. Again, I introduce a resource. I say this resource level of and death. You cannot break it up. You die. And you cannot get negative fatigue. I had an action, which is to sleep. Uh, sorry, a predicate, bed, saying this location is a bed. And an action again, if I'm at location, this action is a bed, I can sleep. That will reset my fatigue. And you can see Yolo executing his little plan. He works, he goes eat, fill up his pocket, goes to sleep. Tomorrow he will return to work and he will eat from work as much as he can. And when he is completely starving and he has no more apple in his pocket, he will return, get some apples. Okay, I can keep on like that. I can drink if he's thirsty. Uh, I don't have enough time. Actually, this demo can go pretty far away. Uh, and I hope to soon give you the full scenario. My point is just in front of you, I added six behaviors. I give him the possibility to navigate, and then I give him the possibility to work. And then I explain him he needs to eat, and then I explain him he, to, he can collect food, he needs to sleep, he needs to drink. I've just done that on half a slide in uh, too much time, <laughs> but a short 15 minutes. <laughs> so how did I do that? Because I was never writing a behavior. I was only writing planning domains. I was giving planning domains to my agent, and the AI was doing it. So this is really the thing. Um, I have to speed up because I don't have much time, so I'm going to give you very quickly a survey of the architecture. So we have on one side the planning domain, all the predicates and stuff you have seen me define. We use this planning domain to make plans, like I showed you. And very important, we have a controller. The controller is the thing that interacts with the game. Takes the state from the game, address the planner. So controller monitors the execution of the plan, replans when needed, Decide what is the current goal, stuff like that. Um, so the big point for you is that when you will develop a game with this system, you will just write the planning model. You will never touch the planner. You will never touch the controller. You will write your game as usual. You will have to write the communication between the game and the AI, and you have to write the planning domain. And I will note that all the communication between the game and the AI are expressed into, uh, uh, in the planning domain. So that's basically the main thing. And as I said, below that, the behavior controller can address an image agent, which can address some form of animation controller or planner. So I, basically, the eye sees the world only through the eyes of the planning domain, like that. So how do you write this planning domain? Well, you have to write a planning domain, so we give you a language. The main thing in this tool is the language. I just showed you my language. My language right now has type variables, predicates, 
actions which have preconditioned, add and delayed effects and cost. I also added something a little bit fancy, numerical variables. And we also have in our prototype uncertain action outcomes. So basically, you can make planning under uncertainty with this system. You don't have to, to say an action doesn't have to have one single outcome, which is very limited. You can't model much things if you assume that every action is going to have only one outcome. You can't model fighting, you can't model exploration, because all these things have uncertain outcomes. So we, we, we put that in the system. Um, OK, I think I'm going to skip this one because we're too short on time. <laughs> and if you want to talk about it, please come to me after I have so much to say. Um, last point. Many of you have probably seen the, the effort which are done in Unity in reinforcement learning, in particular the RL agent. If you have not, please click that link. It's awesome. Um, they have developed a device to a system so that you can plug a reinforcement learning agent into your game, learn it, and put back the controller into your game. Pretty awesome. Um, what we do is a way to, valor to valorize this work. Our ambition right now, we are using a planner. We're defining a planning domain, and we're using a planner to solve, to find the behavior. A planner is not actually used expanding a tree. This has limits. We are using, we're going to use a top-notch uh, search algorithm, but even then, they're going to level off. You can always increase the number of locations, and it's too big. So our vision in the future is actually to be able to use the, the reinforcement learning agent to solve. So you would define your game, define your scene, you define the agent rationality by giving it a planning domain, and then you will solve it with a deep reinforcement learning agent and get back your controller. In this vision, the planning domain becomes a layer of authorship, fundamental to control your game. In a planning domain, you can force an agent to do something in some, in some situation. You just tell him in this situation, only this action is available. Um, you can you explain to an agent what is important to him. So you can make a baker, you can make a soldier, you can make a butcher, whatever, by defining his planning model and giving him butcher rationality, baker rationality, and then the, the reinforcement learning agent will learn to make a perfect baker and a perfect butcher. So this is a layer of authorship for you to use uh, this AI tool. OK. <coughs> the, initial <t> <laughs> the initial title of my talk was uh, Deforesting Game AI. Um, why? So on this screen, you can see at the very bottom, it's a behavior tree. And here, you have a um, final state machine for animation. And on top, it's another behavior tree. So basically, when you develop your games, as far as you're dealing with high-level behavior or animation, you have to, to, to deal with huge graphs that you have to fix by hands, right? Everybody knows it's a nightmare. And everybody knows that as, as soon as you send something in your game, your, your tree, is basically good to trash. So this is crazy, and this is what we want to change. This, and I show you how. By moving from, instead of writing behaviors, we are making you AIs so that you can make, you give domains to the machine, and you get behaviors as a result. That's about all I have time to say. I would like to thank very strongly all the team. Alors, uh, here is a team, the small team, Michael Butler, our uh, animation expert. Trevor, which has been in charge of developing the little demo you have seen. Alexander has been doing the art, and uh, we have lots of support from Reynaldo Zioma, also known as Ray, and Matchen. And I thank you very much for your attention. Here we go. Any questions? You guys are going to look yellow, becoming work early. Hello, Nico. Hey. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with um, semi-scripted or um, scripted sequences where we want like an AI to yep. achieve okay. certain goals or maybe okay, do okay, certain okay. things at certain times? So it's easy. Um, sorry for the movie. In the plan you see one actually is encoded, right? You have preconditions. And uh, only if the precondition is true, you can apply the action. So it's very easy to create a, a fluent, sorry, a, state, uh, a predicate or something. And then when this predicate is true, only one action is available. So that's the first answer. You can force in the planning model situations when there is only one action available. So when you expand your search, you will necessarily. This is the first answer. Second answer. Um, as I said in the beginning, we believe in hierarchical planning. 
And when I said behavior, I put only one block, but obviously we could put more. And they don't have all to be planners. So it's very possible that I make a planner where every action is actually a final state machine. Or I can do a final state machine where I get to a state, and in this state I will do a planner. So this is how we would get there. Um, so yes, it's, you do, this is very important. We don't think you lose any control on your character by going through, through this technology. Okay? You can always force what you want. Um, one other super small question is the, um, the replanning part. Uh, you mentioned that that sort of is one aspect that you would need to touch. You were talking about how you would just define the planning domain and it would sort of work on its own. Yes. Um, is that something that you can do if you want to? Like if I want to you know, say, hey, you need to replan right now because of some gameplay event that happened that invalidates the plan or something like that. Okay. So the decision of free planning comes up from, come from the behavior controller, as I explained in this graph, right? Mm -hmm. This is this guy, which is uh, basically managing all the AI. Uh, at this point, you know, we really prefer, as I said in this talk, I would really prefer that you guys don't have to touch a controller. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we would have some kind of callback functions. For instance, so to define the goal, we might need something which is game specific. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not completely decided that we're going to go like, through that, we're going to give you very, few entries on the controller, the less possible. Okay. Uh, how can we do that? This is because our playing language is very well defined. Everything has a semantics. And so, if this, so now we can make a planner that will work for every problem expressed in that domain. It's easy, because this domain is closed and well defined. It's possible. And then we can make a behavior controller. We have made assumptions on the language, so the behavior controller can implement this assumption. And because these assumptions are very clear, you should not need to touch the controller. If you stay, you stay within the planning domain language we have defined. Uh, one more point, by the way. This is just the first prototype. In the future, we will add more to the language. We will be hierarchical, object-oriented. We are very ambitious, even thinking of going to concurrent planning. Concurrent planning under uncertainty. Boom. We've continued with variables. Um, hi. Is there any tooling for debugging the reasoning? That's absolutely fundamental. Uh, you can do this kind of AI with a very good UI. So we, as you can see, we have made little efforts on the UI. But this is completely fundamental. You must be able to see your plan. You must be able to go through it and understand what's going on. When you're going to get to debug these AIs? So now when you debug an AI, it doesn't do what you want. So you go in your final state machine, and you go in your hack, and you clack, clack, clack. That's going to be Now you use that. It doesn't do what you want. This is different. What did I forget to tell him? What did I tell him wrong? Oh, oh I forget to tell him that this action actually had this possible outcome. So we have to look at your character and see what was wrong. And to be able to do that, you must see his plan. Where is the glitch? And uh, the glitch, so from, are very easy to fix once you find it. Oh, I neglected that outcome. I'm just going to add an outcome to my action, 30 seconds. Uh, also, um, just the behavior which are on the screen now, you know, this, with everything, so pockets, you can put three apple. It's still a very simple game, but I would, not have, I would not like to have, sorry, I would not like to have to write the behavior tree for that, honestly. It's already a little nightmare. To get a behavior which is as optimal as that, it's already a little nightmare. And then, so imagine, I'm going to fix my behavior tree on that. And then I'm going to add another resource. Boom. <laughs> Game over. <laughs> okay. Any other question? OK. Thank you very much.